Hey, hey, this is Carlos. I'm the founder and CEO at Product School. Today I'm here with a fellow product leader, Meron Colbecci, CPO at Checkout. Welcome, Meron. Thank you very much. Great to be here. It's good to have you on the show. I was taking a look at your LinkedIn profile and I've, I've seen you've done quite a, you've had quite a ride in the fintech space as a product leader. Mm -hmm. um, maybe we can start from the beginning and uh, tell us a little more about how you actually broke into product. Yeah, it's, um, a, a, it's an interesting question. Maybe, maybe not necessarily uh, the most uh, traveled path. Um, so um, early years, um, I, was, uh, I spent some time in the military service. Uh, I'm originally from Israel, so I spent some time there. And um, as part of my job, I uh, um, was starting to work on a, a computer system that um, you know, we were trying to, to uh, we were using, I was using. Um, and I started giving um, um, advice, suggestions, questions to our developers um, around, you know, how can this uh, system improve? How can it uh, become better? Um, we weren't calling it product management at the time. I don't think uh, I'm aging myself a little bit. I don't know that it was actually, there was a job called product management, but it was kind of what we were doing. Um, and over time, um, it became something that I really, really liked uh, defining, explaining, uh, creating a roadmap. And, um, and then as I was uh, going through university, uh, studying computer science and history, I really didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up. Um, someone that I knew reached out and said, hey, you did this in the military. It's kind of the same thing here in this uh, tech company. Why don't you come and, 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 and help us out with, uh, um, with product management? Um, and that's how I got into it. Um, and over the year, it's become uh, um, sort of my, my path uh, through my career. You said uh, you studied computer science and history. That's an interesting yes. pairing. Um, tell me more about that. Um, you know, it, it goes back to like on the one hand, uh, not really knowing what you want to do when you grow up. Um, on the other hand, sort of trying to find a balance between something that I thought at the time was practical and could maybe help me get a job uh, in the future. Um, and on the other hand, being very interested in sort of history, uh, uh, something for the soul, uh, if you will. So trying to find that balance um, and trying to um, enrich uh, my knowledge in parallel to doing something uh, that's a little bit more practical in uh, day to day. Mm -hmm. Um, when you, when, where was your first product manager job? So my first product management job um, was at a company called Nice uh, Systems. So uh, how, that, I'm curious to know about that moment because it's a lot of people who also didn't have a straight, straight path into product. But yep. coming from the military, it's really, really interesting. And it's sometimes hard to explain in the civilian world what you've been doing before. So yeah. how do you position yourself or, or in, in order to get a, a shot at getting a, a product, an official product manager job? Yeah, I, I would say, I don't, I don't know that I have like a ton of great advice there. This was a personal connection, someone who kind of knew what I was doing during the military and was like, are you interested in doing something similar? Um, and of course I interviewed and et cetera, et cetera, but there was a, there, there was a network uh, aspect and I think uh, many times, um, I would say for, for folks that are trying to break into product management or think that they want to break into product management, a lot of times I've seen people move from one role in the company to into product management, meaning they did something, they were um, um, successful at it, they started picking up some product management um, tasks, um, and, and then someone on the product team said, hmm, that's interesting. Uh, that's, a, that's a good skill to have. Maybe this person can really become a product management and move over. Um, but um, yeah, not the, necessarily the, a scalable way or a replicable way um, to, uh, to, to break in, if you will. So, you, you, you know, in product, we always say that um, it's very important to not fall in love with the solution, but to fall in love with the problem. And I'm looking at your your uh, trajectory, you've worked in incredible f financial technology companies such as uh, PayPal, SoFi, and most recently, Checkout. So what are those big, big problems you're passionate about? Yeah, so I think that over the years, um, what I've become very 
passionate uh, about is, is um, the problem space of financial inclusion. Um, you skipped one of the companies that I was at, at the in the middle, which was the company now called Meta. Um, and there it was also around, um, I was working on the uh, uh, blockchain project, on the stablecoin project that uh, did not succeed. Uh, but uh, we, um, uh, we were also thinking about financial inclusion as one of the, the, the key um, uh, aspects that we were trying. And, and financial inclusion, uh, to me, what it means is how do we make um, the financial system, the economic system, more accessible uh, to more people, to more companies, to uh, um, um, help them, people that are generally underserved, whether it's, you know, people in developing markets, people, um, you know, in the U.S. that don't have access to, uh, to banking, um, you know, at SoFi, there was the problem of um, people with student debt, um, and how can we help them uh, repay that, that quicker uh, and for, uh, for cheaper? And how can we help them become more financially empowered? Um, and here at Checkout, similarly, um, as, a, as a payments company, as a, a financial services company, how do we enable businesses um, to uh, gain access to uh, payments into e-commerce and, and navigate their way through the digital economy? So it's been a, a theme um, in different industries, different problem sets, but the, the core of the problem is is what uh, really uh, in, in coming back to. Um, and I always like to ask that question because we, we talk a lot about building a product that fits the market, right? Like product market fit. But I think even before that, it's very important to, as a, as a human, to find a problem that fits you and believe in it enough so then you can go out there and be part of that solution. Um, for people who might not be aware of what Checkout.com is in the U.S., can you just quickly tell us a little more about the, how big the company is and, and what it's all about? Yeah. Um, so generally speaking, uh, Checkout's uh, 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 mission is to uh, enable businesses and communities to thrive in the digital uh, economy. Um, we're a uh, our core sort of uh, roots. Uh, when the company was founded over a little over 10 years ago uh, is in, in acquiring, so uh, accepting um, uh, cards and other forms of payments um, uh, online. Uh, that's our, uh, our core uh, capability set. Um, and then over the years, we've, in, we've developed uh, a suite of other products that complement uh, acquiring. You know, we recently launched issuing, so the ability to put cards in the hands of people. We uh, uh, have, have capabilities around risk management, um, and we uh, facilitate payouts uh, um, where companies and fintechs want to pay out uh, to uh, uh, different parties. So uh, a robust set of tools that enable fintechs, e-commerce websites, um, and other sort of um, um, verticals uh, uh, navigate their way in the, the digital economy. Uh, and, and you're very humble because um, you didn't mention the valuation of your company. It's a huge company, uh, obviously way beyond the, the unicorn status. And I think because usually I consider a B2B platform that a lot of uh, end users don't see, they, they might not be super aware, but it's definitely powering a lot of uh, people's transactions behind the scenes. Yes. I mean, look, I, I, I think that, um, for, first of all, valuations at the end of the day, um, you know, valuations go up, go down, different. I, I don't think that this is, um, this is not how I personally like measure like the scale and impact. Um, I, this is not like how our founder does. Like we, we are, uh, we think about the customers that we serve. We think about how we solve problems for them. Um, obviously, you know, we do we, we we do process hundreds of billions of dollars of of, of volume. Um, you know, we serve some of the biggest enterprises uh, around the world. Our core sort of capability is around enterprise um, and and how we can uh, facilitate payments for them, give them the best performance, um, create an acceptance rate that is uh, uh, the highest for them. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, valuation. Yeah, well, that's what you might say. Uh, maybe your investors uh, also keep that in mind. So it's always good to mention just to give a, a context, you know, because it's a huge, huge enterprise. And, and I also want to learn more about your own product team as the chief product officer. Um, <clears throat> how big is your team? And how are you thinking about the structure need depending on the different products that, that you're building? 
Uh, yeah. Um, so our, our so checkout currently is um, around um, somewhere around eighteen hundred uh, folks. Uh, um, we we have a product team um, of like pure product management um, somewhere in the vicinity of a hundred uh, uh, folks. Uh, we also, um, you know, my team also supports design, and we have PMO that, that all sits within the, the the product organization, and obviously, partnering very very closely with with my partner, the the, the CTO, uh, which has uh, engineering and IT and, and other things. Um, in terms of uh, structuring, um, you know, I think that our uh, essentially we've uh, developed. Uh, a number of different uh, uh, products. We've, part of the journey that we've undergone in the last two to three years is to move from a single product fa product company into a multi-product company. Um, so, as I was mentioning, from the core acquiring into the to to the issuing into the integrated platforms into uh, risk management and so on and so forth. So, um, our product are organi organized around these product themes, and we have a few infrastructure groups that support those uh, product verticals. So you have product teams sitting on top, leveraging infrastructure groups that sit uh, uh, beneath them. That's more or less how we're structured. I've started to see <clears throat> that structure more and more, especially in multi-product organizations. They, they tend to have a platform product that is supporting the rest of the product lines. Mm -hmm. So as you think about integrating the different roadmaps or initiatives that you have across the board, if you want to learn more about that, right? Like just CPO, you are ultimately the, the product manager of the product manager. Like, wh what is it like? Uh, um, so, I mean, I mean, I think that one of the challenges um, that uh, I think any company that scales um, to a certain, beyond a certain size, has is this interdependencies between teams, right? Um, and trying to create, on the one hand, teams that are autonomous uh, as much as possible, but on the other hand, you know, not creating replication or duplication of work uh, across the board. Um, and um, I, I think that this is one of the, if anyone has a like um, out of the box silver bullet solution to, to this, uh, please tell me because, you know, I, I haven't seen it yet. Um, but, but I think that this is, this is part of the challenge is like how, like what are, um, trying to decide what are um, core infrastructures, uh, what are verticals that sit on top, um, where is the line uh, drawn uh, between them? How do those teams collaborate? Um, um, how do the how does the vertical team, if they really have a need that the infrastructure team hasn't provided or is not there yet, how do you give them the ability to contribute uh, code to the infrastructure? Um, those are some of the questions and dilemmas. Um, the other thing um, that you know we sometimes like or sometimes don't like to mention is like process. Like you, you need to find um, a, a light enough process. I, I'm I'm not a huge process guy. I don't love. Um, um, I, I don't think that we, we we need to overburden teams too much with process. But um, how do you find a light enough process that allows teams to collaborate, to understand what the needs are, um, align on uh, align the roadmaps to some degree. And then probably most important, it's like surface and escalate when there's conflicts in priority. Um, and I think that sometimes that's where a lot of teams that are scaling fall down. Um, escalation sometimes uh, feels like a bad thing, right? It feels like something that you don't want to do um, because it's, it's a problem. But no, actually, um, an, an escalation comes because th there's a conflict in, in the OKRs, there's a conflict in priorities, and someone needs to settle it, and so that's that's where I think a lot of times my role, when when it becomes uh, uh, important enough, like when my role comes in to help teams prioritize, to help teams sort of settle um, um, these these conflicts and unblock them so that they can execute as quickly uh, as possible. So since you mentioned OKRs, I'm I'm curious to know more about how you define those at at the maximum level as well as at the different product level to make sure that there is some consistency? Yeah, I mean, the, the, we, we run a process uh, at the company uh, currently, which is, I think, relatively robust. Um, we start with, um, at the executive team level, um, you know, the, the, uh, all of the different functional leads, 
together with the, the founder and CEO. Um, and we start this relatively early. We, start, we are actually starting now, uh, going into next year. Um, and we spent uh, like a, a decent amount of time over like a number of sessions to like really think, A, what is our long-term strategy? Do we need to change anything in the three, five year? Um, and then what does it mean for, uh, for 2024, uh, for the next year, for the coming year? From that, um, we, we kind of um, nail down a set, a small set of OKRs, which are the company OKRs. Um, now, as a product company, as a technology company, a lot of these uh, OKRs are oriented around product deliverables, uh, product KPIs that we want to, uh, uh, to ship. Of course, there are financial and revenue targets and so on and so forth that are uh, uh, in included as well. And then usually what uh, uh, my partner uh, and I uh, do is take those OKRs and translate them to what does it mean for product and tech? Uh, uh, what does it mean for us? And there are some things that we take on that that we take on for ourselves that are um, you know unique uh, to our teams. Then we partner with our leadership team and say, all right, are these things reasonable? What are we missing? Um, how are we thinking? Are, are we thinking about all of the right things? What what did we um, uh, what did we miss? Take a few rounds of feedback, um, and then lock sort of the product and tech uh, OKRs, and then essentially cascade them down. And then each uh, sub pillar or sub team. Uh, takes those and determines what does it mean for them, um, and they cascade it down and cascade it down. So I think every single team from the bottom of the org all the way up can sort of see how the work that they're doing contributes to a company level OKRs. Um, you know, it's structural, but it it, it gives people uh, insight on how what they're doing is connected to an overall company goal. Um, and then part of the uh, part of the work is working with my with my team on all right. Are you thinking about this goal aggressively enough? Can we aspire for more? Um, how do we um, are are we covering uh, what, what are the likelihood to success? Is this a stretch goal or is it not? Um, that's part of the work um, um, that, that we do amongst us. But um, I think the the, the tie in between the very bottom level to the top is 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 uh, is really important in my opinion. And how accountable is is your team for uh, providing financial or business results in addition to um, product and tech? Yeah, um, we partner uh, around these things with the uh, with the commercial team, uh, with the uh, marketing team, um, primarily. Um, you know, we are at the end of the day, we're 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 a SaaS company. We're we're a B two B company, and you know, we we have a sales cycle. Um, it's not a consumer play, and so the commercial team, at the end of the day, is the one that is able to drive uh, uh, the revenue and the cross sale and the and the new sale. It's not something that's completely in the hands of the product uh, team. Um, but of course, we need to give them the tools in order to be able to uh, um, to sell them. So it's a joint accountability. Um, um, you know, you know, will we eventually be at a place where uh, a product team can own a PNL potentially down the line? Um, but it's it's not something that's the that, that's the focus right mm -hmm. now. And that's a trend that I'm I'm seeing across the board. Um, more product leaders are either owning PNL or at least um, partnering with a a business a leader to co-join, uh, co-pilot uh, PNL because ultimately, especially now. It's more important than ever for for mm. product to show business value in addition to to that user value. Um, so it's good to hear that. Um, the other thing that I'm I'm very curious about, Maron, is you, how you scale yourself, how you structure your time. Right? We always say in product, it's important to do things that don't scale, especially when you are a startup. Uh, but I've seen that also happen in larger companies. Like for you as a, as a human with limited time, with family, with other things going on, how do you structure your day to day? Uh, it's a it's a good question, um, and again, you know this. I go through through cycles where you know you you feel like you've got something going, um, it's it's working well for you, and then like three, six, nine, twelve months later, you like throw it out and need to like. I, I think that so. I guess my point for this is is that I don't think that it's a static thing. Um, and I think that it's something that you occasionally, you always need to revisit your calendar and what you're spending your time on. Because meetings that you've set up, 
cadences that you've set up, um, they go stale. Um, they become uh, they become less relevant uh, over time, uh, and and you really need to rethink about um, um, how you're spending your time on a every like three six nine months um, to like throw everything out and and try something new. Um, that's 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 how I sort of have tried to do it over the last uh, um, a few years. Uh, once, so you know, I, I I think that what where I spend my time is you know. At a very very high level, I try to spend a percentage of my time with with my peers, uh, sort of with with my sort of stakeholders uh, in the organization, with, with with my founder, with the CEO, um, with um, um, you know my tech partner, et cetera, et cetera. That's part of my time. Part of my time, obviously, spending every week and very very critical with with my directs, with my team, whether it's in a group meeting um, or uh, uh, one on ones to help them sort of unblock. Um, understand what their issue is, um, how how I can help them, how I can support them. Um, try to dedicate a good amount of time during the week to do um, product reviews uh, with the team. Um, this is something that is um, being in the details is very very important for me, um, and um, trying to understand uh, where the teams are, how they're thinking, etc., um, is is part of um, um, uh, my day to day. Same with the design team. Um, and then, you know, there's a lot of ad hoc meetings and, and firefighting uh, that happens throughout the day. Um, so um, sometimes you need to put your uh, firefighter suit on and, uh, and go and extinguish some fires. <laughs> what about recruiting? Obviously, I mean, you, you know, th these times, these days, uh, obviously companies are growing uh, less. Um, um, than there were. Um, we, uh, we are definitely um, much more cognizant uh, about um, growing the team um, and are very sort of frugal um, in, in how we do it, but obviously spending time on recruiting and growing the team. Um, I would say that I spend, you know, now that the leader, like after joining and setting up my leadership team and that's being stable, um, and, you know, of course, obviously you sometimes support your partners, where, where I've tried to spend more time is on um, our a recruiting process, or the the values that we we try to look for, or the skills that we try to look for uh, in the rec in the recruiting process to build something that is scalable. Because talk about things that don't scale, you know, interviewing, um, you know, when when you're trying to recruit 20, 30, 40 people, that that doesn't scale. You can't uh, uh, hire. So it's what what is important is that you have a, a, a process that you can trust, where. A product manager that enters the organization, you know that they've passed a certain bar, a certain threshold um, of capabilities, of, of knowledge, of, uh, of ability to solve problem, of collaboration. And, and so setting up a process where, on the one hand, the, the certain things are, 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 are checked and evaluated. On the other hand, that you've removed bias. Like, how do you set up a, a, a hiring process where um, a committee could sort of can make a decision together and who's the tiebreaker and so on and so forth. Um, that's where I, I've tried to spend yeah. uh, most of my time. Uh, I agree. I think uh, scaling yourself, uh, productizing yourself is, is definitely a, a challenge. And maybe we can spend a little more time on the, on the actual career ladder because uh, definitely it's important to, to, uh, to acquire talent as well as retain talent. And there's so, uh, enough information around like, how to break into product, and then we obviously highlight chief product officer, but there's a big, big gap in between. Mm -hmm. And each company defines their own competency model. So curious to know how you guys think about that career path for product leaders. Um, I think, you know, generally speaking, uh, th there's the, um, as essentially we see two paths uh, for product managers. Um, you know, we have a, a, a leadership path where a product manager becomes, um, you know, a group product man, a senior product manager, group product manager, director, uh, et cetera, where, you know, they, they, they build out um, um, teams underneath them um, and so on and so forth. And then we have an individual contributor path where, um, which is completely parallel, by the way, to, to leadership. I think that a lot of times people think about um, moving up in your career, the only way to do it is through managing people. Um, but actually, you really need like senior um, um, thinkers uh, in to solve really, really hard problems. And so, 
What we've tried to do is create a ladder where people um, um, can move up uh, by the complexity of the problem that they solve and not necessarily by the size of the team or the, or the domain or the group. Um, and so uh, we have those two paths. Um, we, uh, in terms of some of the things that we've, we've tried to do in terms of um, um, enriching and, and, and um, supporting um, the, uh, the buildup of the product craft within the team, um, is different mentoring programs uh, between uh, uh, folks, both peer mentorship and sort of leadership mentorship. Uh, we have this uh, thing that one of uh, the PMs on my team uh, set up, which um, is awesome. It's just Product Jam, which is you know every week uh, or every couple of weeks, someone uh, comes in um, um, and gives a, a speech or, or a lecture about you know A/B testing or um, how do you pull a product uh, strategy deck together or, or something. And so other product managers can learn from that and, and ask questions and so on and so forth. And we also have a, a sort of a, another a PM it came up with the initiative of like having a product circle where uh, uh, folks are doing um, essentially, uh, it's a support group, uh, like for, for lack of better term. Like this is a problem I'm facing. How have you dealt with this, et cetera? And it's a small, intimate, safe group. Very, very important that Leadership is not there. I'm not there, et cetera, so they can uh, talk about everything. And so that's how some of the th ways that we've tried to um, upscale. The, the other thing I would say, and I know that this is a long-winded answer, the other, the other thing that I would say is that I think that every sort of meeting and every product review, uh, design review, strategy review, et cetera, is, is a learning opportunity. Um, and you know the feedback that the leadership team that the the, uh, the 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 other folks are giving to the product manager that is presenting is not just um, a uh, feedback on that particular topic that the, that person is, is trying it's it, it, trying to present. It's a uh, it should be taken as a with as broad a learning uh, as possible, which is why we publish all of the product reviews, we publish all the takeaways, all of the feedback, so that other folks can read it and can hopefully learn from it um, for for when they come around. And what about you? What are you curious about learning these days and how do you make time for it? Uh, well, I think that if I wouldn't say AI these days, it would probably be, uh, I, I, I don't know, I would probably be um, out of touch uh, with the world. And so I think that th this has obviously been a super fascinating topic that has come through. I mean, we've been thinking about AI and uh, over over years and years and years, but you know, in the, the, the the growth of like uh, LLMs and uh, generative AI has been just uh, fascinating. How I make time for it is a, is, is a challenge. Um, um, so um, my my one sort of extracurricular activity that I try to insist on is running, um, and um, and so I, I try to listen to like books and podcasts uh, uh, while I run, um, not on my hard runs, but on the on the long slow ones, um, and and trying to uh, learn about uh, this fascinating world. Um, um, while running. Are there any interesting uh, AI applications that you are either considering or already uh, implementing at your current company? I think, I mean, look, I think that this is going to be uh, revolutionary in, in a lot of work. Like if, if for, for, from, you know, just efficiency of your day-to-day, -day, uh, from data extraction, um, you know, just knowledge, uh, um, uh, understanding, like how we search currently is, is, is ridiculous, right? Like you're trying to find an email and trying to remember a keyword in the email to, to decide, like you can just ask uh, the question um, and it'll give you the answer. I, I think that um, to me, one area that I'm pretty confident will be uh, uh, revolutionized by AI is, is, um, is customer support. Um, and, and I think that's applicable to many industries. It's definitely in, in, uh, um, relevant for us. So, you know, how do we leverage AI to provide answers to customers in, in, in the problem that they're trying to solve? Um, so that's definitely an area. I think risk management uh, is another area that we're, we're thinking about uh, from, a, from an AR perspective. Um, I think that another interesting piece is how do you translate sort of um, code into documentation, um, into external documentation? That's another world that uh, uh, we're also considering and, and, and thinking about. And there are many more. I know. It's fascinating and bullish as well. And if I ask you this question six months from now, I, I know there will be even more and more use cases. Um, just to wrap things up, I, I always like to ask this question around, okay, looking backwards, like if you were to repeat your path and hopefully get to where you are a little faster, 
what are what are the things that you you think you would have done differently? Hmm. Um, have done differently. I, I would. Uh, I think that I'll answer this by um, in the moments in my in the in my career where um, I've done the biggest steps forward have been moments of focus um, and uh, moments of where I wasn't distracted by, you know, um, how, uh, how, how, like positioning and, you know, uh, other things, but like really try to solve a hard problem that was, that mattered for the company, that mattered to the organization, um, put a little bit of blinders on um, and, and, and really try to um, uh, do everything that I can and do whatever it takes, by the way, um, in, in order to, uh, to, to solve the problem. And by do whatever it takes, meaning, you know, if you need to do um, quality or testing or, you know, you need to help like sit down with the designer for hours and really refine the problem or set up the A-B test, like what, that, that's what I mean by uh, uh, whatever it takes. Um, those have been the moments um, that uh, really uh, helped me accelerate. Um, and I think that if I had known that earlier, um, I, I think that I would have done that more um, um, at, at an earlier stage. Um, and, and frankly, like there are times where you just want to go back to that and, and do that uh, again and again, because like those are the times that are also like really, really satisfying and fun. Well, thank you so much for your time, Ron. I, I really learn, uh, learn and enjoy um, with you. It's fascinating to see that even at a CPO level, we're still curious about learning new things, hands on, doing whatever it takes, as, as you said, to, to make your team and, and your company successful. So, thank you. I really, really appreciate your time. Thank you.